It's been two weeks since Robert Mueller finished his investigation and found what many suspected, well, a few suspected, but some of us suspected it pretty vehemently from the very beginning. There was no collusion between the Trump campaign and the government of Russia. So to that extent, the case is closed. But members of Mueller's team want to continue the allegations. In a series of leaks to The New York Times, they have complained that the report, despite finding no criminal activity, should be released because it is, quote, damaging to the White House. In other words, prosecutors working for the federal government no longer see their job as enforcing the law. Instead, the point is a political vendetta and an attempt to influence narratives about people they dislike. How does it make you feel? Is that a proper role of a prosecutor working for the federal government? Glenn Greenwald co-founded The Intercept, and he joins us tonight. Glenn, thanks very much for coming on. What do you make of this most recent New York Times story about what apparently is in the report we haven't seen? Well, it's similar to the journalism that has fueled the three-year hoax that has drowned U.S. discourse, namely that the New York Times, the Washington Post gives anonymity to totally unknown people to make claims that are completely bereft of any specifics, unaccompanied by any evidence whatsoever, so that it's impossible to analyze. And then journalists see it and then start celebrating online on social media and cable news as though it's some sort of a smoking gun. Um, I don't really have personally any problem with having the Mueller report published, since I don't think yeah. that in this case a special counsel is just acting as a prosecutor, they're also there to say what actually happened. I think we'd all benefit from that so that we no longer have to have CIA leaks trying to manipulate our brain. Um, but the one thing we do know, Tucker, about this report, like we know very little, but the one thing we do know that they've said is that these complaints from these anonymous leakers, whoever they are, these anonymous objectors, they're not complaining about the section of Barr's letter that reported that Mueller found no collusion. They're only complaining about the part where Mueller said... It's impossible to say one way or the other whether Trump obstructed justice. So it's amazing that actually the part about the no collusion got bolstered because even these malcontents who are complaining to The New York Times anonymously are saying we don't have a problem with the section finally finding no collusion. We only have a problem with the obstruction issue. What about all the people over the last two years who've been dismissed, and you're one of them, as agents of the Russian government? Where's the justice for them? Where do they get their reputations back? I think one of the things that we've seen over the last two or three years is that journalism more than ever is a profession of complete groupthink and mob rule in part because it's really difficult to be a journalist these days because of financial constraints. Big right. media outlets are laying off huge numbers of people. So if you're a young journalist, the last thing you want to do is stick your head up and challenge the prevailing consensus because you could lose your job, or if you lose your job, it'd be really hard to get another job. Um, and also Twitter makes it so that journalists constantly talk to one another and create these sort of gangs that, design, that are designed to punish anybody who challenges their orthodoxies. And I think journalism has completely disgraced itself at the exact time that they're claiming that a grave danger to the republic is that Trump is demeaning journalists. They've done more to demean their profession with this behavior, calling people Russian agents who question them or Trump supporters or apologists or denialists. They have a whole long line of accusations and new terms to stigmatize anyone who questions their dissent. And it's really effective for a lot of people who, unlike us, don't have established platforms. And there's, uh, it's been really effective to prevent them from being questioned or challenged. So here's a question I want to ask you for two years. You're making your critique from the left. You're on the left. and You're not a Trump fan. That's a, that's a tough position to take, and you've maintained it this whole time. What, what a, why were you able to maintain an independent perspective on this when so many others weren't? You know, it's amazing because if you think about it, the question, is there evidence to demonstrate that there was collusion between the Trump campaign and the Russian government is completely bereft of ideology. It doesn't matter right. whether you're on the left or the right. You're just looking at evidence. It's just an exactly. epistemological question. And one of the things that has happened is that everything is so tribalized. So they actually want you, if you're to maintain your, stand, your good standing on the left, to lie. They want, they, they're demanding you lie. They're demanding you say that you see evidence and you see a convincing case for a conspiracy theory, even if you don't really see it. And I have to say that unlike establishment journalists like Jeremy Scale, Matt Taibbi, and myself, 
who have the protection of being established. There were a lot of young journalists like Michael Tracy and Aaron That's Maté right. and a bunch of others who are very vulnerable, who have the courage to incur the wrath of this, this profession in order to do what journalists should do, which is to say what it is that they think without any fear of who it, who it angers, and very few of them are willing to do that, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. I, I agree completely. We've, we've had Tracy on the show a number of times, another brave, a, a brave journalist. Glenn Greenwald, thank you very much.